Hello everybody. Once upon a time, my default position regarding anything SUV shaped was automatic hatred. I saw absolutely no reason why the vast majority of people would ever need one, certainly those who live in any kind of urban environment. However, in the last few years, my attitude has softened for a couple of reasons. First off, I have come to realize that there are people for whom they have a genuine need of something like this, which include the owner of today's car, Derek, because this is the kind of road that he has to take this car on, and a fine job it's doing too. Sure, for 99% of people, and 100% of those living in the M25, the off-road ability of anything is totally irrelevant. But there are also several other things about the SUV I've come to appreciate. I love the driving position. I know, I know, I know. I've recently done a video where I moaned about people that buy cars just because they sit a little bit higher. Well, in that video, what I was actually moaning about is the true enemy the crossover, because those are cars you see that possess none of the fine qualities of the hatchback on which they're commonly based, nor any of the strengths of the SUV that they're pretending to be. Those who follow the channel may have recently seen my piece where I fell in love with a first generation Porsche Cayenne Turbo, because though it is a car that really, really I should dislike, on account of the fact that Porsche makes sports cars, not SUVs, it actually had a really rather charming combination of luxury, practicality and genuine off-road ability. But I appreciate the Cayenne Turbo is not the car for everybody. It's a bit gaudy, it's far faster than it needs to be and when it breaks, and it will, it is going to be very expensive. So today on the channel, I'm looking at a car that promises many of the same things I loved about the KN, but in a package which is just a little bit less ostentatious. of today's video, a word from my sponsors, Car Vertical. Because, to be honest, if you are thinking of buying a cheap Land Rover, you do need all the help you can get. And with just a registration or VIN number, Car Vertical will perform a search that in just 60 seconds will cross-reference a number of databases across the globe to give you all the information you might want to know on a car you're thinking of buying, including accident damage, mileage issues, usage as a taxi, or outstanding finance. Car Vertical are currently offering 10% off to followers of the channel, and to get that discount, just just follow my link in the description or comment section down below. The history of the Land Rover Discovery is quite an interesting one, and a tale that is familiar to many manufacturers. Once upon a time, there was the Range Rover, and it was something of a genre-defining car. It took the idea of a luxury car and a 4x4, previously two entirely separate lines, and combined them. This turned out to be a genius idea, and today the Range Rover is still considered by many to be the benchmark of luxury off-roaders. However, there was an issue. As the Range Rover moved ever more upmarket, it also became a little bit more inaccessible to the customers who'd made it so popular. To address this, in 1989 we saw the arrival of the Discovery, a car designed to offer many of the same features as the Range Rover, in fact being built on the same platform, but with more accessible, more economical engines and at a generally lower price. The trade-off being that the equipment list, the interior and the performance just weren't quite as good as the Range. The first generation car existed in two guises, the original Discovery and later the Discovery 2. Believe it or not, but even the second one was still based on the same platform. So, a chassis that had been introduced in 1969 was still on sale in 2004. At that point, it was discontinued and replaced with the second generation car, originally the Discovery 3. The car was built using a relatively unusual construction method, what Land Rover call integrated body frame, the combined elements of an old ladder chassis with the more modern unibody construction. So what you have here is a cell that comprises the engine bay and the passenger compartment, in which you have the engine and, of course, all the interior. However, this is then sat atop a basic ladder chassis that contains the suspension and the gearbox. The idea here is to give you a little bit more of the refinement and the luxury from a unibody car, but with some of the durability of a ladder chassis. The downside is that it is a rather heavy thing. This car weighs about two and a half tons. However, in this category, I would say that's not too much of an issue. 
Though in the UK, the first of the second generation cars was known as Discovery 3, elsewhere it was simply branded as the LR3. The reason I'm told being, and please let this be true, the first generation car had acquired such a poor reputation for reliability, it was felt that to call anything else the Discovery would be a little bit unfair and almost certainly doom its chances of success. The Disco 3 soldiered on until 2009 when it was replaced with this, the Discovery 4. Initially launched with the 2.7 litre engine, also shared with Jaguar and built for Jaguar and Land Rover, it was quickly replaced with the 3 litre, which is the item we have here today. Elsewhere in the world you could actually get these with a naturally aspirated 5 litre petrol, but sadly not here. Now, though I would absolutely love to trash this car for its choice of engine, and I'm sure that has something to do with relatively low values today, the fact is it's an absolutely perfect fit. This is the slightly higher power SDV6 variant, and on paper it really does the business. 245 horsepower and a staggering 443 pound-foot of torque. That's 600 newton meters. This is mated to a six-speed ZF automatic gearbox that a couple of years later became an eight-speed. And the fact is that though 245 horsepower may not sound like a lot, especially when it's pulling two and a half tons, it's more than adequate. This thing has a frankly shocking turn of pace. It's really quite brisk. Put your foot down, the car knows what gear it wants, and you're off. The red line is fairly modest at just over 4,000 RPM, but the fact is it doesn't take very long at all to realize why Derek is quite so smitten with this car. He's had it for just over two years now, and in that time it has been totally reliable. Never ever let him down or had anything untoward go wrong. That's fantastic, and I'm sure a great surprise to many people that feel all Land Rovers will break. Now, trust me, I'm not the sort of person that's going to try and convince you that all Land Rovers are actually brilliant and will never fail, because I know that simply isn't true. But they're not always quite as bad as can be made out. And though this car has an incredibly wide remit, it's used for both the school run and going to the most remote parts of Scotland on a shoot, it absolutely nails the brief every single time. First off, it is super practical. There is loads of room in this, and like pretty much all Discoveries, it's also a seven-seater. I'm not quite sure how generous the rear row is. There's a bit of stuff in the boot I didn't want to take out, but the seats are still there. Most of the time, I think people are going to run this in five-seater configuration, where it still has ample legroom for passengers in the back and a fabulous boot. Like the full fat Range Rover, it also has the classic split tailgate, which even for rigging up and filming today is absolutely brilliant. I just love that kind of stuff. It doesn't have the twin sun visors, though. This one is an SE spec. There were three to choose from, the S, SE and HSE. I'd be lying if I told you I knew what the difference was, but from my reading, S is probably best avoided, and if you can, go for the HSE. At the lower end of the scale, these cars apparently were just far, far too stingily equipped. Even this one doesn't exactly feel luxurious in here. There are elements that I recognise from nice Jaguars and things like that, and switches over here that you'll find in just about any Volvo over a 20-year period, but those are then mixed in with things like these controls here for the heater that I'm sure are great and designed for somebody with gloves on that's freezing cold to be able to operate easily, but they do look quite naff, and they're all set in a really, really nasty, cheap plastic dash that feels pretty awful, to be honest. The steering wheel, likewise, it's um, chunky and lovely and all that, and has paddles, hilariously. I'm really not sure that's all that necessary, but not particularly nice in the hand, and the controls, plenty of them too, um, they're not that nice to operate. But we do have leather seats, which are very nice. The quality of leather is pretty good too. They're heated as well, and like I've said, there's quite a bit of space in here. It's really pretty good. And the car's not massive, 4.8 metres long, which makes it about the same length as that original KN, yet this has a lot more capacity in it. As standard, these come with permanent four-wheel drive, and they have a couple of differentials, one in the middle and an optional one at the back, meaning they can do more or less all the off-roady stuff you'd expect of any Land Rover. 
as with many other Jaguar and Land Rover products of the time, the gear selected down here is a rotary item. I have to say I don't actually love it because for doing basic maneuvers and things, it's far too easy to put the car into sport mode rather than simply drive. You should have to press the thing down to get it into sport or, or something like that, but um, that is a minor gripe. You have also a bevy of different modes down here for any sort of terrain you may find yourself on. Currently, of course, I have the car set to road. More or less all discoveries of this generation, other than potentially the absolute bare bones basic ones, also come with air ride. And that has a couple of nice tricks up its sleeve. Not only is it surprisingly comfortable, air ride isn't always, it has, for example, sensors in it that detect when the air ride suddenly isn't doing quite as much work. Why does it need that? Well, if the air ride system suddenly detects that the car is now three or four hundred kilos lighter, what that probably means is that the chassis is resting on the floor. So the air ride automatically responds by raising the ride height, hopefully clearing you over whatever obstacle it is that you've got yourself beached on. Another thing that Derek has done with this car, and something he does to all of his 4x4s, is to fit it with some proper off-road tyres. But here he has made a compromise. It's currently wearing a set of Goodyear something or others, and he chose the something or others because they were the off-road tyre best rated for noise. I'm sure you've all had the experience of being on the motorway when some poor sap in a Defender comes past with proper knobbly off-roaders on, and it's making a ridiculous din. And you think, ooh sod that for a laugh. Well, on one of his other cars, Derek has a set of BF Goodrich, and they're so bad that he doesn't ever want to go above 45 mile an hour. This, had you not told me it was wearing off-road capable tyres, I just wouldn't have guessed. It's really, really quite good. Now, sporty it may not be, and I'm never ever going to pretend otherwise, but to drive, this thing is actually a real delight in that way that pretty much Land Rover and only Land Rover have managed to master. Sure, it's not all that capable, the steering rack is pretty slow, deliberately so, and it's a fairly wallowy thing too, tip it into a bend and it will lean. But it's also really nice, the steering is light but communicative, and it is genuinely properly comfortable. It's also a good height, this thing. I just went past one of the cars I was talking about earlier, and um, you actually look down on them. And that's a car people think is big. I once nearly had a fight with a man at a car wash because he tried to charge me the large car price to clean a Nissan Juke. Am I wrong? A Nissan Juke's not a big car. This is a big car. This is a proper car. I like it. Really comfy. And because the Disco 4 is essentially an evolution of the Disco 3, much of what they did was the stuff that you can't really see. Sure, it got the usual treatment, new bumpers, new lights, that sort of stuff. The interior was a little bit sexier. But they also made a whole host of improvements to all the bits you don't see, but which in reality are probably quite important, especially for a company like Land Rover with the reputation that they have. So this car is generally regarded as one of the best that they made. And as they continue to build it, they continue to improve it. So, general advice is, if you're going to buy one, get the latest one that you can. But evidently, even this early one still can be as reliable as you need it. The infotainment here is familiar to anyone that had a Jag in about the same period, and it's functional. The Meridian sound system, likewise, is OK. It does the job. I believe you can also update this, like with the Jag, to Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, meaning this would be a very, very usable daily proposition, provided you don't need to go near any ULEZ zones. It will even, on a run, do what you might term reasonable fuel economy. So then, overall, feels like a pretty decent car. How much are you going to pay for one of these? Well, the Disco 3 is dirt cheap. Those on Autotrader are going from about 1,500 quid. But they did look like a sort of spares or repair example, with decent working cars, complete with MOT, only commanding about 2,500 pounds. I would, though, say, if you can afford it, to get the Disco 4, because you could pick up a car like this from about £7,000, with very late example cars, they finished production in about 2017, going for about the £25,000 to £30,000 mark. And to be fair, if you've got about £10,000 as a budget, though it isn't quite as desirable as the full-fat Range Rover, not as luxurious or sporty as a Porsche Cayenne, it still does feel like a very, very honest, down-to-earth car, and I'm sure when it does break, which it probably will at some point, it is likely to be a bit cheaper to repair than the Cayenne. 
and it's certainly going to be cheaper to run day to day. There is no such thing as an economical first gen KN. There just isn't. And I certainly wouldn't want one with the base V6 petrol. That's just going to be totally, totally underwhelming. But this, it works. It does the job. It's not exactly a first class lounge in here, but actually this is another example of a car that I'm finding myself really liking a lot more than I probably should. Would I ever have one? Unlikely, because I am a card-carrying tart, and it's just a little bit too plain for me. I think I also might be a little bit addicted to the V8 in the KN, and I think it is a crying shame that the UK market was denied the V8 here, because that would be quite a buy. But uh, the diesel, for those who can live with it, is a cracking thing, and as it happens, the Discovery is actually quite a good car. Who'd have thunk it? So there we go, that's another video from me rabbiting on about 4x4s, which I know little to nothing about. If you'd like to help me on my quest to become a little bit more knowledgeable, and you have something a bit like this, or in your mind, a lot better, please reach out. My email address is in the description of every single video. And I want to say a huge thank you to this car's owner, Derek, for allowing me to borrow it and take it down some country lanes, have a little bit of fun, and genuinely, really quite enjoy it. And as ever, thanks to all of you for watching. Don't forget to comment down below, hit the like button, and subscribe if you haven't already. We'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.